want to get into the Word this morning. I want to start reading in Acts chapter 1. And uh, we'll read two passages here that we're going to kind of camp out in. Acts chapter 1, all of our scriptures and notes are also in the ICLV mobile app, which you can download from, the, from uh, your, your mobile app store, Android, iOS, it's all there. But here's what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14 through 19 in the New Living Translation. You guys love the Word of God? It says, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was also, this was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling headfirst there, his body split open, spilling out all his intestines. In case case you needed some more detail there of what happened, spilling out all of his intestines. Just wanted to give you a graphic picture there. Thank you for that. Um, Verse 19, the news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem spread to all the people of Jerusalem. Okay, now we're going to skip and we're going to read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, New King James Version. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come or had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Speaking of the Antichrist, that language, son of perdition, was also used to describe Judas as well, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that as he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist will declare himself God and want to be worshiped because that's what Satan has always wanted, to be worshiped as God. Unfortunately, he's not. Sorry, Satan, you're not God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Everyone say, the lie. Line. Say, wow, what do those two passages have in common with each other to present them in a message here this morning? Thank you for asking that very articulate question because I have a message prepared just for that question. But the title of this morning's message is what I will call Shift the Atmosphere. Shift the Atmosphere. Let this be a warm up to our Holy Spirit conference, which also has the theme Shift the Atmosphere. See, as we read in Acts chapter 1, this was the beginning of the church. This was the genesis of the first century church. Jesus had died on the cross, buried in a tomb for three days, had rose again from the grave, had walked with his disciples for 40 days, and he had ascended into heaven and handed everything over to them. And now they were to wait in Jerusalem for power from on high to go out and preach the good news of the kingdom and build the church throughout the entire earth. They're getting ready to get started, and news of Judas's scandal has spread throughout all of Jerusalem. (laughs) This is an often overlooked verse. Sometimes we rush to Acts chapter 2, but we skip over Acts chapter 1, where the reputation of the church was controversy, betrayal, and scandal. It says that it spread to all of Jerusalem. In the Greek, uh, another translation there, it uses this word for known. It was known in all of Jerusalem. That same word, known, is also used in Acts chapter 9, verse 42, where Peter raises a woman from the dead, and the Bible says it becomes known in all of Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. 
And so in the same way that a positive testimony can spread and go viral and lead to people coming to Jesus, in that same type of potency, this bad story about the apostles, about the apostle Judas betraying Jesus, allowing him to be arrested and to be crucified, and then eventually he commits suicide. In the same way a testimony can spread, this bad report about the church was spreading throughout all of Jerusalem. It was a toxic environment. The church wasn't born with momentum. The church was born in controversy and scandal. The good news is this that even though at the time they were notorious for compromise and betrayal, the book of Acts doesn't end there in chapter 1. No, there's 28 chapters total in the book of Acts because after that, God pours out an anointing on them to overcome those circumstances and spread God's kingdom throughout the earth. So we're going to come back to the early church and, and how God shifted things for them to turn the corner away from Judas's betrayal and death. But an important thing to, to recognize in this story is this, is that Peter was able to discern God's plan in the midst of that toxic environment in order to overcome. He pointed to Judas's fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. If you study this out longer and unpack it, you'll see that he points to Old Testament Psalms to say, hey, what happened with Judas was unfortunate. Hey, this is what everybody's talking about. This is what we're known for. People are saying, wow, the Jesus movement has ended. The Jesus movement didn't work. Man, th th we thought God was in this. I guess God wasn't in this. People are saying that, but don't be concerned because this is actually a the fulfillment of God's plan according to scripture. It's okay. We're going to, this too shall pass, and God is going to help us navigate this and overcome this. He was convinced of God's sovereignty in the unfortunate circumstances that they would be able to find a pathway through it. Why is that so important for us this morning? Well, for this reason, we are on a collision course with prophetic timelines. We're on a collision course with prophetic timelines. We're living in the last days and prophecy is unfolding before us. And it's very important that you understand that or else you could be discouraged. You could be disoriented. You could be confused and you could be tempted to quit in the near future. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul was telling him that there was two dynamics coming, the second coming of Christ and the coming of the lawless one, a.k.a. the Antichrist. And just like Peter, we have to understand God's plan in order to operate in faith and receive a specific anointing for the specific times that we're living in. Because he wants us to shift the atmosphere. So I want to talk to you today about rising above ever-changing surroundings. Rising above ever-changing surroundings. If you were just to go back in your mind, in your memory, go back to 2017. Just go back five years ago and think about your life and think about our society and think about the way people thought about things. It was a completely different world just five years ago. Since COVID, the, the different the fads and the trends in popular culture, what's happening with technology, everything is different just five years later. And that rapid change, it's not going to decrease or slow down, in my opinion. It's going to increase. But God wants to give us an anointing to rise above all of it. So let's talk about this. There's a couple of things that are important in this. Number one is this. You have to discern your coming opposition. Discern your coming opposition. You can't shift the atmosphere if you're confused about what's going on. The Christians in Thessalonica were confused about their persecution and about the second coming of Christ. And so Paul begins to try to sharpen their discernment. He says that we read it already. I'll just read, read through it. Verse 3, let no one deceive you. Someone say deceive. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. See, we live in the last days. But the day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ. And the day of the Lord or the second coming of Christ is a series of events. 
It's not just one instance or one moment. It begins with Christ returning to gather his church, and it ends with his physical return with the armies of heaven to defeat the enemy and establish God's kingdom in the earth. But it's a, the, 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 the day of the Lord is a series of events. And what Paul says here is before that all begins, you have to understand there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be many believers that will give up on their faith. In the parable of the ten virgins, Jesus talks about five virgins that are wise and five that are foolish. And he's saying, and that, that parable is about the return of Christ. And what Jesus is saying is that when he returns, half of the church will be a false church. Half of the church, half of believers, not the world, half of people who think they're Christians will not be ready for the return of Christ. What is that? It's the great falling away. They asked Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 3 and 4, the disciples, they said, what are going to be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And the first thing Jesus says, he says, hey, take heed that no one deceives you. Say deceives. And then a few verses later in Matthew 24, 24, he says, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect, not the unbelieving world, those who consider themselves followers of Christ. And so what's coming, according to the prophetic timeline, is an increase of deception in the church and a falling away. We already see the beginning of it in our day. We see the church that is on the fence about whether or not there is a hell, even though the Bible tells us very clearly there is a hell. It was created for Satan and his demons, but if we don't put our faith in Christ, we will go there as well. That's what the Bible teaches. That's not what Andrew Mason teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. But thank God the Bible also teaches us about heaven. You know, heaven comes from the Bible. People want to tell you about all the different ways to get to heaven, but heaven comes from the Bible. And so if you want to know how to get to the heaven of the Bible, you should probably understand how the Bible tells you to get there. And that's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Not because, not because we're better than everybody else as Christians, but because there's only one person who lived this life without sin and went to a cross to die for your sin and rose again as a substitution for your sin and, and, and to be the first fruits of eternal life. There's only one who's ever done that, and his name is Jesus. He did it for you. Nobody else. Nobody else has done that for you. And thank God you live in America. It's a free country. You can do with that whatever you like. But it's salvation being offered to you, and you have to receive the gift of salvation in Christ if you want to experience eternal life. Many have made that decision. I made that decision here when I was 15 years old, and I have zero regrets. He is so good. But the church, Big C Church, seems to be on the fence about these things. No clear stance about sin and righteousness. Well, well, you know, you talk about that being a sin, and well, it's just it's, it's a complicated issue. No, it's not complicated. If the Bible calls something sin, that means it's disobedience to God. It's not complicated. It's only complicated if you want it to be complicated. I'll tell you what is complicated. You know what is complicated? Humbling yourself before God, taking ownership of your sin, repenting of your sin, asking God to come in and heal, making a commitment to live for God. And Sometimes that gets a little complicated. I'll give you that. That's why we have the church. We're here to walk through it together in this journey called grace. But what's right and wrong in the Bible, not complicated. It's not. And so there's going to be an increase in deception in the coming days. Let's not be confused. Jesus, the Bible, predicts this. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, here, verse 7 and 8. It says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. Again, second coming of Christ, a series of events. And so he says, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And there's a general consensus amongst many Bible scholars that what Paul is talking about here is the Holy Spirit's presence in the church in the earth. 
And that when Christ returns and he gathers his church to him, when the rapture happens, the the, the presence of the Holy Spirit through the church, that portion of the Holy Spirit's presence in the earth, it is removed from the earth as the church is gathered back to Christ at his second coming. And when that is lifted up from the earth, we are salt and light. When that is lifted up from the earth, it it gives way for the enemy to reveal the Antichrist and begin his plan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they should believe the lie. What's going to happen is once the Antichrist is in the earth through a series of events, he will get to a place where he, where he will declare himself God. He will declare himself Messiah. He will demand that the world worship him as God. And the Bible, the New Testament, calls this the lie. Everyone, anyone ever been lied to before? Right? Anyone ever told a little white lie? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, that's a little white lie right there. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> a lot of lies, right? A lot of lies out there. A lot of lies in our journey and our experience, right? Well, the bi- right here it says, this is the lie. This is the lie of all lies. That there is a Messiah other than Jesus who is worthy to be worshipped by mankind. And so this is why it's important to understand the coming opposition. Because there's two, th- there's two tracks that, that are going right now simultaneously. There's the track of the second coming. I think we have a slide for this. The track of the second coming, which is where there is a passionate bride and gathering back to Christ. Where, where God is stirring up his church to be passionate for him because he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, and that we are to be ready for his return. This is what the Holy Spirit is stirring in these last days. Not a comfortable church, not a complacent church, not a lukewarm church, not a politically correct church, but a church that is passionate about Jesus. This is what the Spirit of God is doing in this hour. But there's another track as well, and it's the coming opposition, which is the falling away and the lie. The falling away and the lie. Before the second coming of Christ, the falling away will happen. And then eventually, when the Antichrist appears, eventually the lie will cover the earth like a dark cloud. So Satan isn't just going to spring the lie on the whole world suddenly. Meaning this, I'm about 99.9999999% sure that tomorrow the Antichrist will not appear and will not announce himself God. That would be too fast, all right? Sometimes as, man, as human beings, we're gullible and naive, but I don't think we're that gullible and naive, right? So what does he have to do? He has to slowly build up to the lie, right? He has to start by getting you to doubt that you have a creator, and he presents all this scientific theory to say there's no such thing as a God that created the universe. Then, then he has to try to get you to doubt the, the image of God that was stamped on you at birth and creation, right? That, that you're, you're born in the wrong body, right? You, can, you have to doubt everything about yourself, right? And he starts to sow these little lies to, to begin to erode biblical truth, to begin to erode the reality of God so he can slowly set the table for a falling away and the lie, right? And so that's what he's going to do. He's going to increase deception to get to the falling away and the lie. And you have to understand that's what's coming at you. More deception. Deception you never heard of before. Ideas you've never heard of before. You think things have gotten bizarre in the past? Just get ready, baby. It's going to get a little bit more bizarre. I think of when I was just out of high school, I got to visit Washington, D.C., and I went through the Smithsonian Holocaust Museum. Spent two or three hours there. Felt, felt like I'd only seen about half of it. Couldn't stay there all day. And, and to say that when I walked out of that place, I was sobered is a great understatement. And I thought I knew the story of the Holocaust. I thought I was familiar with the history of World War II. But when you walk through that, when you walk through a room piled up on both sides full of actual shoes of prisoners from the Nazi concentration camps, prisoners who had been killed, and you have a room full of shoes and you realize how real this is, it was sobering. It was sobering to understand 
how vulnerable and gullible the mind of human beings can be. That they were presented with a proposition, a quote unquote solution to the Jewish problem, which was genocide, and people went along with it. It should sober us to the reality of how far deceived we can be. But see, in the book of Acts, Peter knew that Judas' scandal was a part of God's plan. And he was able to position himself to shift the atmosphere. That's why you have to understand the coming opposition. That's why you have to understand when when, when people begin to question things. And if there's a great falling away of half of your Christian friends fall away, you have to understand this was all predicted by Jesus in Scripture. And so you have to discern the coming opposition number two. You have to guard his truth and he will guard you. Guard his truth and he will guard you. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He will guard you from falling away. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.10. It says, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't receive the love of the truth. Two other passages, 2 Timothy 1.13 and 14. What you heard from me keep as a pattern of, as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit. Everyone say guard. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The spirit of truth, right? And then Psalms 91.4 says, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. It's talking about a shield that you hold on on your arm. So guard the deposit of truth inside of you and truth will be a shield that protects you. Go ahead and put that picture up of the Platte River. The Platte River is a river that runs through several states. Um, but when early American settlers discovered it, they, were, they, they, had, they came up with this phrase about the Platte River. They said, oh, this, this river is a mile wide and an inch deep. Ever heard that phrase before? A mile wide and an inch deep. It was used to describe the Platte, the Platte River. Its discovery by French explorers resulted in the French word for plate, Platte, which means flat as its name. And the Platte River is a broad and shallow channel of water that runs for over 300 miles through the state of Nebraska. And there wasn't a lot of utility that they could get out of this river. They couldn't use it to bathe. They couldn't use it for drinking water because it was so shallow, it had a lot of mud in it. And so it couldn't be used as as a normal, uh, clean, flowing body of water like a normal river. It also couldn't be used for any... uh, you know, commerce. It could, boats could not go down. They couldn't put merchandise on it and ship it down the river because it wasn't deep enough for boats to use it for transportation. And so, not very picturesque, mile wide, an inch, an inch deep, and not a lot of utility, not a lot of mission that can be accomplished with this shallow river. And unfortunately, I would say it's an example of us today as believers when it comes to the truth. That when it comes to biblical truth, many times here in America, we are a mile wide and an inch deep. We have more Bibles printed today and in circulation today than there's ever been in the course of human history. There is more biblical knowledge published on the World Wide Web than there's ever been. There are sermons on YouTube and and sermons and and podcasts and online workshops and online classes. It's everywhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet many times Christians are still deeply divided about foundational biblical morals and theology. When it comes to truth, we are a mile wide and an inch deep. But Paul says in Colossians 1.16, to let the word in Christ dwell in you richly. Everyone say richly. Oh, man, I'm not talking about material possessions. I'm talking about the knowledge of the word. When it comes to knowing my word, I pray I'm a millionaire in Jesus' name. I want to be a billionaire in Jesus' name. I want the word of God to dwell richly in me. I want it to consume my thoughts and my emotions and my instincts and my intuition. I want it to shape how I see the world and how I I function in my relationships. I want the word of Christ to dwell richly in me. I don't want to be a mile wide and an inch deep. 
See, the enemy is coming to increase deception. And one of the ways he's coming to increase deception is by moving us off of the centrality of Christ. See, Jesus is the center of it all. Jesus is the, is the center of heaven. Jesus is the center of creation. Jesus is the center of the universe. Jesus is the center of history. Jesus is the center of the plan of redemption for mankind. He's in the middle of it all. And even society that doesn't 100% believe in Christ, they still have to acknowledge Jesus Jesus' authority, his influence, and the possibility that he was the Son of God. But I'm telling you, the enemy is going to increase deception to get even half the church to question that. The enemy is going to increase deception to delegitimize the very institution of God's church. See, the church is the carrier of this message. You say, Pastor, do you think something's coming? Yeah, I do. What do you think it is? I don't know exactly, but I'm going to tell you what it's going to do. It's going to question the centrality of Christ, and it's going to question his church, the carrier of that message. First John, it talks about the Antichrist spirit that denies that the Messiah came in the flesh. It denies the very existence of the Messiah. And I'm telling you, there are things that are going to be released that you have not heard yet, that we have not seen yet. They're going to question the very foundation of our knowledge of Jesus and his church. And it's going to cause a falling away over time that will set the table for the lie. We need to have a love for the truth. Are you in love with the word of God for your life? If you know that the Bible is rooted in love for you, you will love getting rooted in the Bible for your life. This is no ordinary book. It was penned by the Holy Spirit on behalf of your creator. See, sometimes my, 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 my kids, my boys, they have a new toy or some new device, some new electronics, and they'll come to me, and I'll be doing something. They'll say, Dad, can you help me figure this out? Uh, this is supposed to work a certain way. It's not working. I'll ask them. I'll say, go get the instruction manual. And I'm trying to teach them the first place you go is to the people who made the product. The people who made the electronics, they're the ones that can tell you how it's supposed to work. It's the same thing for your life. We don't just believe the Bible because we say it's the Bible. We believe the Bible because it's from our creator, the one who designed us, the one who knit and fashioned us in our mother's womb, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, the one whose will fulfills. Sometimes our flesh doesn't want the will of God, but that's your carnal nature. You need to trust the will of God because he knows you better than you know yourself. And in the end, if you obey his will, you will find out that his will actually does fulfill. We get truth from our creator. I don't believe every word of the Quran because it wasn't written by my creator. I take my creator's word over every other word. Thank you, Jesus. Worship team, I want to invite you guys back up. You guys are fun to preach to. Discern your coming opposition. Guard his truth and he will guard you. Increase your spiritual appetite and faith to overcome. Increase your spiritual appetite and faith to overcome. See, Jesus is coming back for a passionate bride. He's not coming back for a bored bride. Oh, church is so boring. No, you might be boring. He wants a bride without spot or wrinkle. He wants our lamp to be filled full of the oil of the Holy Spirit, burning brightly for him in a lost and broken world. He wants us to carry his delegated authority to demolish every stronghold and overcome all opposition. There will be a falling away, but there will simultaneously also be a great harvest of souls coming into the kingdom because it's impossible. It's impossible to have an on-fire church for Jesus and for people not to get saved. 
for people not to get set free, for people not to get healed. It's impossible for light to come into darkness and not shift the atmosphere. Acts chapter two, we read Acts chapter one. The church was born in scandal. All of Jerusalem heard of the scandal of Judas. Here's what it says in Acts chapter two. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting and then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Hallelujah, because we give praise for God's word. They were hiding out. This is the same group of people that when Jesus got arrested, they all fled. Yeah, Peter denied Christ three times, but all the disciples fled as well. They weren't ready to be arrested. They weren't ready to be persecuted for Jesus. And they're all hiding out in this room. And the power of the Holy Spirit falls upon them as they're seeking the Lord for 10 days. And they leave that place full of God's presence full of God's anointing, full of boldness, full of conviction, and they begin to proclaim the gospel. They begin to face persecution. They begin to declare, we cannot help but share what we have seen and what we have heard. The same ones that all left Christ can no longer keep their mouths closed about Jesus, no matter what the consequences. What happens? The Bible says, the sound of a mighty rushing wind blew through that place and there wasn't a single curtain that moved because there wasn't a breeze going through there it was the sound of a mighty rushing wind it was a sound and see all the noise from the toxic atmosphere all the noise about the scandal of Judas all the noise and the fear and the trauma about what happened to Jesus and all the questions and everything that they were just all that noise it just got flushed out by the sound of a mighty rushing wind and they were consumed with their Savior. They were consumed with what they had been born for, with the mission that they had been marked for. Everything else was pushed out of the way. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Come on, what's the noise that needs to get flushed out in your life? Come on, anybody got some noise? You need a sound of a mighty rush. Come on, my hand is raised. Lord, would you bring the wind, Lord God? Would you bring the wind, Lord Jesus? Come on, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, can you stand with me this morning? Lord, bring the wind this morning. Father, we ask, Lord God, for a fresh anointing, God. Lord, not an anointing from the past, but anointing for the hour that we live in, Lord God. We say, Lord, we don't have enough of you, but we need more, God. And we ask, Lord God, for a mighty rushing wind of your spirit in this hour, God. I thank you, Lord, for an anointing, for a power that is equal for the task at hand and that is greater than any power of the enemy, God. I thank you, Lord, for a church, God, that will overcome for you, Jesus. Oh, he's here. Oh, he's here. Come on, just begin to pray and praise right now. He's calling out. He's calling out to you. Are you all in? Are you in to overcome? Are you ready? He's calling out this morning, but you gotta surrender to him. You gotta surrender to him. anything else I don't want anything else
close your eyes. The Holy Spirit's here right now and he's moving across this room. Come on, just give me a few more minutes. Don't anyone move right now. He's here. Come on, there's people here. He's reactivating things that have been dormant in your life. There's a reactivation in the spirit right now. There's a reactivation of his plan and his calling on your life. There's a reactivation of intercession right now. Come on, just surrender to it. Just let it flow out of your innermost being. There are living waters right now in the name of Jesus. There's other people, there's been voices, voices of trauma, voices of doubt and discouragement. It's the voice of the enemy. And the Lord right now is releasing an anointing for freedom right now. He is delivering you right now from every lying voice of the enemy that's been harassing you. In the name of Jesus, the harassment has to cease right now. In the name of Jesus, I ask for clear skies in the spirit, God, right now. Man, if you need prayer for that, we're gonna dismiss in a few minutes. If you need prayer for that, feel free to come forward and get prayer at the end. We prayed for a number of people in first service that were getting touched by God. But before we leave, there's some people here this morning. I'm talking to you, this is your moment. We prayed for you. You need to get right with Jesus this morning. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And if you need to do that this morning, we want to pray with you before you go. There is no reason for you to leave uncertain about your walk with God. If you receive Christ, if you get right with God today, you can know that your name is written in heaven. And I'm going to count to three with every Christian praying in this place and the good news being proclaimed. I want to invite you when I get to three that if you need to get right with God, if you need to come back to your Father today, when I get to three, I want you to slip up a hand. Come on, pray, Christians. One, the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart. Two, today is the day of salvation. Three, just lift up a hand right now in this place. You need to come back to Christ. Yes, I see hands going up. Come on, hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Jesus sees it. Hold it up. I see hands on the floor. I see hands in the stadium seating. Hallelujah. This is what's going to happen. We're going to worship here for just a minute. And as the worship team begins to play, if you lifted your hand, I want to invite you. Just begin to right now make your way out of your seat. Come down. I want to pray with you here right now. Hallelujah. Just begin to play. Come on down. Give me Jesus, and you can have all this world. You can have all this anybody else? Just come down. Jump in, jump in. Jesus, you can have all this world. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Want to begin right? We got your shoulder to shoulder up front. I want to see everyone's eyes. I want to see if everyone could look at me right now. The Bible says this, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And you guys have demonstrated to the Lord that you're not playing games, you're not playing church this morning. You're taking a step towards him and he is taking steps towards you right now. And I just want you to go ahead and close your eyes. And we're all together in, in, together in concert here gonna say this prayer together. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Jesus. come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the grave. I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I turn from my old ways and I want to follow you from this day forward and the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Now just close your eyes, just wait on him for a moment. Father, I ask you right now by your spirit to fill them with the love of the Father. Let them sense the blood of Christ right now 
cleansing their sin that was red like scarlet and making it as white as snow right now. There is no shame. There is no fear. I thank you, Lord, that you are beginning a new work in their lives. And the Word of God says, what you begin, you will bring to completion in the name of Jesus. Church, can we give him praise for what he's doing? Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hey, here's what we're going to do. We have leaders behind each and every one of you, and we want to pray with you personally. We want to pray with you personally, and we want to share some resources. So if you could just turn around 180 degrees, and there's a leader there. Oh, church, is today a good day, church? Listen, if you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer from some of those deceiving voices of the enemy, we're going to be down here. You need prayer for anything, we'll be down here. But church, we love you. God bless you. Go in the victory of Christ this morning. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLB here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.